The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, Romans chapter 10, we're at verse 19, the last three verses of this chapter, it's page 17 of your notes. We are to uh, lay aside every encumbrance and run the race that is set before us. We as believers are from the point of salvation we're in a metaphorical race, and there are rules. As all athletes know, in any kind of athletic endeavor, you violate the rules, you're disqualified. The good thing about the Christian way of life is, if you violate the rules in a minor or major way, a part of the plan is you can reset yourself. That's why we have rebound. That's why we have 1 John 1, 9 and all the verses that deal with the rebound adjustment to God. If we didn't sin, we wouldn't need 1 John 1, 9. It wouldn't be in the Bible. But since we do sin every day and we stumble in many ways, we therefore need a quick way to reset ourselves, so to speak, i.e., get ourselves in fellowship. In fellowship, out of fellowship. There is no such thing as a Christian, as a believer, from the beginning of time to the end of the millennium, in a natural body with an STA that isn't going to commit a variety of different types of sin. All sin is sponsored by the mental attitude. It starts in the mental attitude. We just, we'll just uh, pick one sin, fear, worry, all the uh, things related thereto. Who doesn't do that from time to time over sometimes the stupidest stuff? We get out of fellowship and start worrying about it. And not, not that we haven't seen God take care of things over and over and over, but he is patient with us. And uh, when we rebound, we're back in fellowship. When we're out of fellowship, well, that's what we are. Uh, so let's take the usual time. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough. You can hear it a million times. Your Christian life and the quality of it is your willingness to get yourself back in fellowship after whatever and roll forward spiritually and do the directive will of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We thank you that you have continually provided for this local body the way of life and life more abundantly. And that's why we're here. We're here to be informed with regard to the subject matter that's specifically in front of us so that we can orient to your plan like you would have us to. Bless our time together in Christ's name. Amen. All right, one of the topics, the main topic, the topic, Israel getting themselves in this fix. These are the chosen people. These are the people with all the advantages as compared to the outside world of the Gentiles. The Gentiles were running off into paganism. And God called Abraham, eventually established the Jewish nation to be a light to the world, a source of an alternative, the truth, for those out there that were positive and beat up with the religion of the times. So Israel has all these advantages, and yet her prophets, God had to send prophets 
to call Israel back in line. Sometimes they responded. Most of the time, as far as I can tell, they didn't. It was all laid out in their law. It is in black and white. They can see it. This is, the, this is the key to the individual and to the nation as a whole to be blessed mightily of God in all areas. It's in the code. These are the blessings. You do your part, I'll pull all the rest of the strings and make these things happen. Then on the, the other side of Moses' address was the cursing side. You go down this path, then these are the things that are gonna happen. Well, they went down a bad path more than once. There were exceptions in their history, not just individuals, but times when the nation was in pretty good shape. But you're dealing with millions of people, millions of people with volition and sin natures. As Israel grew in population, <clears throat> their history up to a point uh, their predilection, their STA predilection, was the idolatry thing, the worship of false gods and all of the corrupt practices associated therewith. And they would fall into this. This ac accounts for two of the dispersions. The dispersion of the northern kingdom, of which the members of the northern kingdom uh, never did come back to the land, and then the southern kingdom, because Israel is a nation split into two nations after the death of Solomon. They will be reunited into one nation under Jesus Christ, the second advent. Then, in captivity, uh, and well, at the Jews that came out of the out of the one captivity, out of the Babylonian captivity, they, they did well for a while. And then they slipped in to reversionism, religious reversionism. The ones out in the, uh, scattered among the nations, they went into reversionism. And it's a really bad form of it, arguably worse than the idolatrous stuff. They got into salvation through the law. Do these things and you'll qualify yourself for the kingdom of God. In other words, salvation by works. And along this line, they didn't like certain topics in the Bible. I don't know what they did with them, how they explained them away. The first one was that when their Messiah would show up and they believed in a coming Messiah, that he would be, by the nation of Israel, rejected rejected he would suffer they didn't want that there were exceptions obviously among those who I hey I'm going with the Bible I don't care what my parents are doing or what the other people are thinking this is what the scripture says that he came to his own and his own received him not of all people they rejected him this followed a pattern of abuse and rejection of their prophets through time. So this one, this stands out like crazy in the Old Testament that the Messiah in his first coming or advent would be rejected, despised. Of all people that should have been held in the highest esteem it was Jesus Christ. But they didn't want it that way. Remember, this isn't their plan. It's God's plan. God anticipated their negative volition. And uh, he put in front of them a stumbling block. This is, this is where you put the truth in front of someone and they stumble. You're righteous. They aren't. They shouldn't have stumbled over the truth. So he put this stumbling stone in front of them. It's in their prophecy, a stone of stumbling. Surely not us. 
There's got to be something wrong with that. As I said in the preceding sessions, they should have known from the law that the reason that the bulk of them were expelled from the land and of course the final dispersion into the church age of 70 AD and just like their prophet said would happen, you'll be, I will, I will, I will scatter you to all the nations. I will drive you out of the land. You can't behave yourself and abide by truth in the land. I'm going to evict you. It, doesn't, it isn't contradictory. Temporary, however many centuries are involved, of banishment from the right to be in the land as a nation, this was in their prophecies. They should have known it. Now that's not going to change them, but individuals could have known it and said, I'm going with God and his plan, and some did. There were always those, that minority, that remnant. And that's what you and I are. We're a remnant of positive volition. I don't care what other people say. We're a remnant. We take the Bible seriously. We approach it properly, and we've stuck with it. We don't have to be perfect, not even the pastor. We just have to be on, on cue with the truth and the doctrines contained therein. Now, there's another one, and that's in our verses. There's another thing that should have popped up at them. Because of your persistent negative volition to the most, the, the heart and core of the true faith is the Savior. Well, you rejected him, and you went for salvation by works. You didn't reject the concept of a Messiah. You rejected who the true Messiah was for a made-up whatever. I mean, even in the tribulation, the, a, 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 lot of the, a bunch of the Jews in the land are going to embrace the Antichrist, who is out and out, a Luciferian Satanist, and it doesn't cover it up. He's not in the closet Satanist. He's out in the open with it. This shocker. Right out in the open. And he's going to call himself God. And there will be those that line up with him. Right on the, on the edge of the most glorious period in their history, the thousand years. But there is a remnant. There are those that will not abide by it. The false, the ultimate false Christ. Once you reject Christ, you're open to false Christs and ideas and prophets and everything. They're all over out there. All kinds of strange people, Christian, non-Christian, promoting stuff everywhere. I don't pursue it. I don't have time for it. Now there's something else that he's going to do that he that he prophesied through the prophets that I'm going to replace you. I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a replacement people, a non people. That were a non people in the sense that they weren't covenant people. They weren't in a special covenant relationship with God. I'm going to replace you. I am going to, to use the term in football, or maybe in sports uh, in general, I'm going to bench you. And you're not going to be out there on the floor playing. That's a weak illustration, but it's the best one I can come up with right at this moment. So this is where we're at. But I say surely Israel did not know, did they? This is again, debater's technique. Asserting something that isn't true and then shooting it down. But I say, Israel did not know. Surely is added here for emphasis. But I say Israel did not know, did they? See, 
Yeah, the did they because it's a it's a it's a rhetorical question. Yes, they did know. They did know. They had it in front of them from as early as the first example, Moses, at the head of when it, it, it became national Israel. First, Moses says. First is it simply the adjective protos, first in order. Moses says, present active and dignity, under divine inspir inspiration, Moses says, repeat, and uh, he quotes what God revealed to him. I will make you jealous. I will make you jealous. That's future from Moses down the line. Para zelao. You might see that the word uh, for zeal is at the, uh, with this para alongside. I will make you jealous. By that, <clears throat> excuse me, by that, which is not a nation, the negative not, by a nation which is not a nation, by a nation, ethnos, which is not a nation, by a nation, Without understanding, adjective, instrumental, neuter, singular, uh, sunitas means to be without, in, 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 be without understanding. I will anger you. I will really tick you off. I'm going to make you angry. I'm going to make you jealous, and I'm going to make you angry. The word anger is make anger, make angry is a future indicative. Again, these are futures looking down the line to when this would come to pass. The word verb is only used here in Ephesians 6, 4. First prophet, the great prophet, the prophet Moses, prophesied long-term that God was going to make Israel jealous with a non-nation, by a nation. And since you probably know who that is, it's not a nation in the typical sense of a group of people who live in a particular geographical boundaries. It's the church. It's the, fir it's the first hint of the rise of the church. We are a nation. We are designated a nation in a special category, but we are an ethnos, a nation. Israel was a nation. The church, Israel was a nation in the usual sense. We, 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 we have territory, we have X number of people, and we have a law code. And Isaiah is very bold, very forthright. And Isaiah is very bold, present active indicative, apo to mao. It means to be bold. And says, <clears throat> I was found. Now, I in each of these verses is God. I'll make you jealous, etc. The second one. I was found. Present passive indicative, hirisco, means to find something. And I was found by those who did not seek me. How can you find somebody that you're not seeking? Find something you're not seeking. We'll try to explain it. I was found by those who did not seek me. Eris passive indicative, hirisco, to find something. Uh, by those who did not seek, present participle, the article, zeteo, to seek something. By those who did not seek me, I became manifest. The adjective manifest, ephanes, manifest. I became manifest by those 
who did not ask for me. The word ask for is ep erotao, present participle. Now, but as for Israel, he says, and of course, that is God coming back to Israel and focusing on Israel. All the day long, day in and day out, I have stretched out my hands. I have stretched out my hands. Stretch out is the aorist indicative, ek petanumi, stretch out. All day, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a people, and this is, we had ethnos for nation, now just when you're just saying a people, it's laos, like the country laos. And he describes them as disobedient, op, I, theo, to disobey something, and obstinate. Obstinate, present active participle, anti lego. To speak, it literally means to speak against something. But here it is used for spiritual obstinance, stubbornness, in the face of the continual appeal God is making. Now, but we'll work, we're working first on these, these two quotes of uh, the anticipation here. Verse 19 opens with the same kind of question as we noted in verse in verse uh, 18. Remember in verse 18? But surely they've never heard, have they? This will explain why they're the way they are. And then the answer is no. And last time or so on Sunday, we pointed, I pointed out to you that the Jews worldwide through time out in dispersion, those in the land today, they know They've been, they've been told who the true Messiah is because there's all these Christians out here that said that the, that the, the Messiah is Jewish, fits everything in the Old Testament, and then all the information in the New Testament squares with all the Old Testament prophecies regarding the person of Jesus Christ, his life, his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, all of it. It's in, their, it's in their Old Testament. And it isn't hid, and it isn't in just one little place over here. It's boom. At the head of the pack is Isaiah 53. But others, there's, other, there's Psalms and other things that talk about this. And the New Testament simply reflects this that he came to the chosen people, the people that he raised up, the people that he, through time, did all this for and brought them down this line. They, they rejected the human Messiah, the God-man. They rejected him and, in effect, rejected God. And they locked themselves into this mode. And they are this way to this day. Again, I belabor the point, there are wonderful Jewish exceptions that are believers. The New Testament is loaded with examples in the early church. I've met Jewish believers, Christians. They broke from the mass of Jews. They're still locked into this. They will have nothing truly to do with Jesus Christ. And, and the fundies all, you know, they all, they're all over there on goodwill missions and everything. I'm giving you the gospel. You're on the road to hell. You just drop that Jewish pride stuff. It isn't going to get you anywhere. You're deluded. As long as you think that being a good Jew, following and going to synagogue and doing all that, that you're all right with God. No, you are not. 
John the Baptist made it clear to those people in front of him, and Jesus made it clear. We have Abraham as our father. And they disrespected Jesus and said, we, 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 weren't, we weren't born of fornication, saying that he's the illegitimate child. Reflected, I believe, in the Jewish Talmud, which they're always quoting. Not that everything in it is wrong, it's just they, they, they attack him. But the, but the Christians, I think, I, I get the impression, it's an impression, I get the impression the Christians over there are uh, cozying up to them uh, and making it seem like everything's okay when it isn't okay with you. It is not okay with you. I'm not your enemy. You can make me my, your enemy, but I'm here to give you the gospel, the, the same one Paul gave to them and got all this hell for. They think they're the light to the world right now. They are not. They are in darkness. It's a different form of darkness, but they are in darkness. If you believe in salvation by works, whoever and wherever you are, then you're in darkness. The worst darkness. It's one of the frustrating things. Read the scripture. No, Jesus responded to that, we're of Abraham. Like genetics, you, flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God, including the Jewish blood, genetics. He said, you're of your father, the devil. He isn't just giving mean language out. That would, that would, you don't have to give constitute hate speech today. You're of your father, the devil, which is a true doctrine. Before salvation, our spiritual father, whatever our human father was, our spiritual father is the devil. And we broke from his kingdom when we believed in Jesus Christ. Now, we may go back and serve him, and many Christians are serving him, but the heavenly father is their spiritual father. So, you don't pull punches with people. You point these things out, that you're headed the wrong direction. And when prophets and down the line and Jesus and then the apostles did that, they, they got a lot of grief from the Jews. They really did. You want to hear something that sounds real anti-Semitic? Came out of the mouth, well, out of the, off of the pen of the apostle Paul. He said, they become the enemies of all mankind. Now you can run with that and get crazy with it, but it means that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing with regard to the nations and properly representing who and what this Bible, the Bible you say is the word of God, the Old Testament. You, it's, it's, in, it's one of his epistles, I think Thessalonians. You become, they become the enemies of all mankind. They're not pointing people in the direction of truth with their religious facade and, their, and all the rest. No, no, they are not. If you can't even get the gospel straight, then you're an enemy to, human, to humanity. Write that one up there. Boy, they'd be screaming anti-Semitism all over the place. It's not anti-Semitic, it's the truth. The difference uh, between verse 19 and 18 is Israel's name, and the word here is changed to know. Verse 18 makes it clear that Israel heard the gospel centered in their prophesied Messiah. And they continue to hear the gospel, and have heard it through, through time, because what are these Christians all about? Well, these Christians out there, what the ones that are actually explaining it halfway correctly, <laughs> I hate to say that, but the ones out there that, that, that presumably are Christians because they believe that this Jesus Christ of the Bible, New Testament, is the Jewish Messiah and Savior of the world. That's, they, so they've heard. They've had it thrown in front of them for centuries. Since they slipped into this salvation through the law and conveniently ignored or distorted those scriptures 
like the ones about the suffering Messiah and the ones about when you're, when, when I evict you from the land, it's cursing. I want to bless you in the land. But if you get so bad and corrupt and do not turn at the last minute, and there was instances where they did, turn back to God at the last minute and cast away their idols and got their act together, he called the dogs off and delivered them. The, As the Assyrian event of the southern kingdom in the day of Isaiah and Hezekiah. They came as close to, to having happened to them what happened to the northern kingdom, but they turned to the Lord in that city. That city repented and turned to the Lord, king on down. And God killed 185,000 Assyrians in their sleep. And Israel was delivered and went on for, our, for went on went on until the, the, the fifth cycle of 70 uh, of 586. Then they come back, and they go back, and then they get into this mess. They should have known from their law that if we're out of the land, ipso facto, that means as a matter of fact, if you're out of the land, if you're out of the land, kicked out of the land, dispersed among the nations, it's because you acted up. And the formula for getting back is to get your act together spiritually, and I'll bring you back. Then they could have went to their other prophet, Ezekiel. See, these are the Jews today that hold up Ezekiel, hold up Moses, hold up Isaiah. They hold up all these, and they even quote from some of these things. It's like the blinders are unbelievable. He didn't return you in the last days and establish the nation we constantly know today as Israel, that we currently know as Israel. He didn't restore you because you got your act together in captivity. It seems to be a contradiction from what it said in the law of Moses. You get your act together in dispersion and I'll bring you back home. And we'll start over. Because I can't cast you off forever. But I have to wait until there's enough of you and so forth. So uh, the prophet Ezekiel made it clear. And they highly esteem him. He made it clear that in the last days, I'm going to restore you, but not because of any righteousness in you. I'm going to return you in a state of unbelief. And then, down the line, a generation will come on where there's a bunch of them that will turn to the true Messiah and get their act together and walk away from this mess and embrace the Lord like crazy. That's in all, all the Old Testament. In verse 19, Paul introduces another anomaly, and that is parallel to Israel's exposure to the gospel. Five, and that is what was prophesied by Moses and Isaiah regarding Israel's demotion due to their intransience. If there's a word you don't know, look it up. Six, is in verse 18, and here in verse 19, Paul uses debater technique by asserting the opposite of the reality and then shooting it down with scripture from the Jewish Old Testament. Seven, the fact of Israel's abject unbelief might cause one to assert that Israel did not know the pertinent facts regarding the content of the gospel and their rejection in favor of an unspecified people, unspecified nation. The double negative, me'u, is a strong assertion of that which is contrary to the evidence. The refutation of the supposed assertion is seen in Paul's quotation of two Old Testament prophets or passages, Deuteronomy 32.21 and Isaiah 65.1. Excuse me. Deuteronomy 32.21 is from what is called the Song of Moses, where the prophet refers to a time when Israel would be set aside in favor of another people. Now, that's not all it deals with but it deals with that aspect of Jewish history. Paul recognized that the fulfillment of, this, of that aspect of the prophecy waited until the advent of Christ and the startup of the church age for it to become official. 12, that other nation, that other people was a people who had not enjoyed a special covenant relationship with God like Israel enjoyed.
They didn't enjoy that. Again, as I've said, Gentiles at any time in history, like anyone else, can get saved, and there are those in Old Testament times that did. But they were just you know, a trickle compared to the mass of Gentiles out there. But they existed. And there, there, was, there, was, you know, there, there was the big uh, Assyrian conversion. That's, that's, you know, in a class by itself and so forth. Uh, that other nation was a people who had not enjoyed a special covenant relationship with God. 13, since, it, since Israel came over the course of time to despise her birthright, like Esau. It's acting like Esau. I mean, not... Esau was exposed to the doctrine of salvation through the coming Messiah, as was Jacob. He wasn't buying it. He didn't buy it. That's why he was rejected as the firstborn. What good is it to be a Jew and have all the trappings and go to hell? It's not worth much, is it? And we'll just, we'll just deal with Orthodox Judaism, the, one of the main religions on this earth. Judaism. God would choose another people slash nation. Heads up. Moses said it. Isaiah said it. Again, this is, this is not the news we want to hear. The same with the, with the nature of their Messiah. They didn't want to hear that part of it. Or he would have never been rejected at the first advent. And that would have posed some problems. But God works all things together for good. They rejected him like his brothers rejected Joseph and made fun of him and abused him. And God exalted him over them all because they wouldn't listen. Their pride, whatever it is, who are you? You're the, you, you know, got any more dreams for us? People can be really nasty. And it's easy to get caught up in the flow of what everyone else is thinking. I tell you this over and over. You got to think for yourself. You got to listen to the scripture and the word of God. And if anyone is telling you something that contradicts it, you need to, you need to go deaf ear on them. Period. But that's up to you. You want to act like the Jew? Act like the Jew of, 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 of that we have known from all of this. So since Israel came over the course of time to despise her birthright, God would choose another people nation. For this means that this other people would prove to be sufficiently positive to the very foundation of a viable relationship with God, namely the gospel of Christ, that they'd come out of the woodwork. Another people, enough people over time to justify a new dispensation, a hidden dispensation, hidden in the counsels of God. The angels didn't even know about it. A mystery dispensation, the mystery of this other people. Now it would only be natural for people to sit around and guess, well, maybe it's this nation over here. Maybe it's Egypt. I don't know. Maybe it's uh, uh, whoever. And there's no way an Old Testament prophet will all do diligence. And prayer could have broken through and figured out who this was. It's people, individuals from all the nations, regardless of race, language, or any other factor in this new nation. 
the details of which will be described, it was, re was revealed through primarily, but not exclusively, the Apostle Paul, a Jew. <laughs> Israel knew or had been exposed to this prophecy of replacement. It must have really grated on them. Well, you know, it, it's just what people will do. You know what they'll do? They'll just blow it off. That nah, doesn't mean what it says. There's something else. Spiritualize it, or I don't know what they do with it. <laughs> Excuse me. So they had been apprised and warned of the outcome of their stubbornness their hardcore negative volition to sound teaching, starting with the gospel. How many peoples are out there, groups out there, have distorted and perverted in one way or another the gospel? And I've had people, you know, that are, well, as long as they're telling people how to be saved, they're okay. I don't agree with this about them, but I'll, you know, fellowship with them and blah, blah, blah. Anybody who preaches another gospel, Paul says is anathema, he's hardcore. Well, we're glad they're saved. A particular denomination that says you gotta believe plus in order to secure it. We're glad the people are saved, but we don't go for this. This is an offense. This degrades what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It degrades it. He is all sufficient. What he accomplished on the cross towards sin during the three hours is all sufficient. And his resurrection from the dead validated that his work was perfect. He accomplished what it was supposed to. Jesus, he reflects the same mentality in his teaching. Of course, he was really liked for this. He brought it to their attention. But he, prophe he prophesied it uh, in its near term, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen real soon. Now, real soon would be from 33 AD to 70 AD. Is that real soon? It is comparatively. Because they knew, they knew, they knew eventually. Those that looked at it seriously. God's going to set us aside as his representative people before the nations. You know, he, 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 he's, he's going to lock us out, not of salvation for individual Jews, but we're not going to be the exclusive Israel of old for a while. Because there's this other prophecy that said they'd make a resurgence. They'd come roaring back. But that waits for the tribulation and on into the millennium when they'll, they'll achieve their highest level of glory. Now let's look at the analogy of uh, here, the, the prophet Hosea. You remember his, uh, his, what, what did, I, I want to say poor fellow. I don't, I don't, no. This parody, if I can use that word. This parody. I want you to marry this prostitute. Okay. And so, as they would say, he made an honest woman out of her. <laughs> he made an honest woman out of her. So that problem, see Israel, Israel, once they got into Egypt, they got to messing around with Egyptian idolatry. Remember Operation Golden Calf at the, at the very spot of the giving of the law for crying out loud, does I strike you? They didn't do it later. They had all this stuff packed with them. They, they, brought, they, brought, some, they brought their st some of the stuff of their gods out of, out of Egypt. It's in there. And then they have this big thing when Moses is gone for 40 days. Oh, he's gone forever or he died or whatever. Uh, and so they, they, they start the golden calf uh, 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 carryings on at the foot of Sinai. Uh, Sinai. This, after they heard God's voice from heaven? You think that's scary enough? 
You wouldn't be doing it there. You wouldn't do it at all, but I mean, okay. So it's kind of like this woman. But anyway, because Israel became married to Yahweh officially at Sinai. It's like a marriage thing. Here's what I'm going to do for you. This, do you want, to, you want to keep this law? These are the things I'll do for you. I'll do my part, and here's your part. All that the Lord says we will do, talk is cheap. And yes, there were those that did. Oh, yeah. Two of them. Joshua and Caleb, out of hundreds of thousands, and you're worried today about, well, there's not that many people that are interested in the truth and coming to Maranatha and blah, blah, blah. Get your eyes off that. If that has a, been a problem with you. And I, I'm speaking to myself as well. But going back to the, the uh, Hosea and Gomer. He marries her, makes an honest woman out of her. Israel has a relationship with God. He's blessed them in through, through periods of the Old Testament. And then she jumps ship and goes back to her old ways. That's Israel today. That's Israel today. And has been Israel this way for a long time. And so the prophet, he can't have a relationship with a wife that's out here uh, selling herself. Now can he? But in the end, he redeems her from the mess she got herself in. Now, her, obviously, her volition was involved. She had been reduced to a, someone's sex slave and was sold on a, at an auction. Who wants her? Hosea did because he was told to. He took her back. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> and that's Israel in the millennium under God. They're going to come back. Gomer is going to make a big change. Otherwise, what's the point of that whole, that whole, that whole episode? Uh, I will uh, resume at point 17 here tomorrow night. See you then. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us and encourage us in Christ's name.